Okay, so in last lecture we discussed about uh, span of a set of vectors and then we graduated to uh, basis. So, uh, a linearly independent set of vectors is called basis, a linearly independent set is called basis if it generates the entire space. A linearly independent set S that belongs to vector space X, uh, which generates the entire space. That means the span of that set is equal to the entire space. Then it is called as a basis vector. Set so it's called as a basis for that vector space. If the number of elements in the basis is finite, then we have a finite dimensional vector space and if this linearly independent set is an infinite set then we have an infinite dimensional vector space. So, number of linearly independent vectors that generate the entire space that defines a uh, basis and uh, if that number is finite we have a finite dimensional vector space if that number is infinite. Infinite dimensional vector space example would be uh, set of continuous functions over 0 to 1 or set of continuous functions over 0 to 2 pi, set of continuous functions over minus pi to pi, all these all these vector spaces I will encounter many such uh, examples, but these 2, 3 examples I gave you just now because we have seen something like this in some examples, we have looked at a boundary value problem in which we had to look at set of continuous functions over 0 to 1 or set of continuous functions over 0 to 2 pi, this is something which you have looked at when you studied Fourier series in your undergraduate or minus pi to pi, right. We studied Fourier series and we will be anyway revisiting Fourier series soon next week. So, we have these two concepts. Uh, infinite dimensional space and then uh, we will be using finite as well as infinite dimensional spaces throughout our uh, throughout our study of numerical methods and this this particular uh, so this particular this is not something which I am just introducing uh, out of uh, uh, completion or something this is something which we are going to use and you will see when we start talking about transformations how these spaces come into play. Uh, we need to introduce one more concept which is called as a product space ok. So, a product space a product space is composed of two vector spaces ok. I can create a new vector space I can create a new vector space by combining two vector spaces or more vector spaces ok that is called as a product space. Well, the simplest example of product space is R n, where R is a vector space line, one dimensional vector space ok, line and I can create R 2 by R cross R ok, I can create R 3 by R cross R cross R and so on. So, likewise I can create a vector space by merging two or more vector spaces those are called as product spaces. <coughs> so, if I take two vector spaces x and y both defined on field f ok. Uh, Uh, 
then x cross y what i mean here is this is x cross y x cross y this is also a vector space So, if I take an element x belonging to vector space x, if I take an element y belonging to vector space y, then this combination x y it belongs to the product space. Okay. Uh, as I said, simplest example of this is uh, r square, r cube, r n, or c c square, c cube, c n. N dimensional vector spaces are the simplest example of this product spaces. See the way you can go about thinking about it is that you start with R, R cross R is a vector space, then R square cross R is a vector space, okay, I get R cube. So, R cube cross R is a vector space, so I get R to the power 4 and so on, R to the power not power 4, R 4 and, and so on. So, my vector spaces could be compositions of multiple vector spaces, but this I can extend to some other uh, uh, to create more complex spaces. See, for example, my x, my x can be set of real numbers, and my y, my y can be set of continuous functions over zero to one. My y can be set of continuous functions over zero to one. I can create a vector space which is x x cross y okay which is i can create a vector space which is r cross x cross y it's possible to have a product space which is defined like this okay we will hit into these kind of spaces when we start talking about uh, boundary value problems and so on. So, examples of this will come in ample later when we uh, when we have uh, when we study about transformations of mathematical problems into computable forms. So, that is where we are going to need this. So, I am not going to give examples right now because many examples will come a little later, but this is an important concept product spaces. Now, having defined linear vector spaces. Uh, vector spaces, sometimes they are called as linear spaces, sometimes in people refer to it as linear vector spaces, uh, words are used interchangeably. Now, here uh, we need to define more structures and as I said, the first thing that comes to your mind is length of a vector. Okay. So, I need to define what is length of a vector when I, when I go to a set of continuous functions over some interval. What is length of a vector now? Okay. So, we have to systematically define okay, something equivalent to a magnitude or length. Okay. What we define here is a concept called norm. Okay. Now, you can have a vector space defined in mathematics, in function analysis, you can have a vector space defined without definition of a norm or a length on it, just set of objects which satisfy certain criteria. Okay. So, uh, what I want to say here is that norm is an additional structure that we are putting on the space. So, we have normed vector spaces. Or norm linear spaces as they are often referred to. Normed vector spaces is a vector space together with a definition of a norm. Okay, a vector space well x f f here is the field associated with the vector space okay Okay. So, norm vector space is nothing but 
a vector space together with a norm defined on it and uh, the definition of norm and the definition of vector space uh, it, it's not that given a vector space there is a unique way of defining norm we'll see what is a norm and then uh, i'll give you'll understand why i'm saying it's a pair okay so for example in three dimension itself we will define different norms and three dimensional space with one norm will give you one norm space three dimensional space with another norm will give you another norm space okay so it's not that the three dimension space uh, if you are working three dimension means you have to use one particular norm nothing like that so uh, a vector space together with a norm definition will give you a norm linear space and then it will have certain properties so what is this what is this norm so norm is a generalization of concept of length of a vector so when i say length of a vector all of you think uh, probably from your undergraduate experience in a in one direction uh saying that well it's thus if i give you a vector in three dimensions uh with say three coordinates x y z then x square plus y square plus z square whole raised to half this is what we know as norm of the vector or length of a vector we don't know any other way of looking at it so a vector space together with a fun uh, a definition of norm defined on it forms a norm vector space so what is a norm norm is a real valued function norm is a real valued function in fact it's a function that is defined from 0 to infinity it's not defined on the negative side of the real line it's a function defined from uh 0 to infinity so given <coughs> vector space or let's work with a set of real numbers so given a vector space norm of a vector x that belongs to x norm of x is a function that is defined from x to r plus set of positive real numbers well length if you look at why i am saying this because length of a vector in three dimensions is always positive it cannot be negative right so i need a generic function which exactly has similar properties as that of the concept of length in three dimensions okay don't forget that at any point uh, that we are generalizing concept from three dimensions to look at the notions in higher dimensions so so the first property that the norm function should satisfy is norm of x should be greater than or equal to 0 for any x that belongs to x norm x equal to so this norm function should be always greater than 0 it can be equal to 0 only for one vector only for one vector that vector is the origin if it is 0 for any other vector which is a non zero vector then that function cannot define a norm so the first criteria for a function to qualify as a norm is that it should be a a positive function and then it should be zero only for the zero vector it should be non zero for any non zero vector the second quality is if i multiply if i multiply the vector x by a scalar alpha then then what should happen norm x should be equal to mod alpha norm of alpha times x norm of alpha times x should be always equal to mod alpha times norm x for any scalar for any scalar alpha it's very very important second property and a third property 
of the length function in three dimensions is triangle inequality okay so this is a way of saying that uh, if i am given a point the shortest distance to the point is the straight line okay so the third property is Now, triangle inequality is a result which probably you study in your undergraduate, undergraduate you study in your high school. Okay, the sum of length of two sides of a triangle is always uh, greater than the third side. This is this is just this is the say that that result which is being generalized. So, if I take any two points in the space, the shortest distance is. Uh, shortest distance is the straight line connecting the two points any other way i try to go to that point in the vector space by addition of two vectors uh, you know that will be the larger path that will not be so this is this is a very very fundamental property of the concept of length in the three dimensions which we are generalizing to any other vector space okay so now anything any any function that satisfies these properties would qualify to be a norm function will qualify to be a norm function see for example in three dimensions three dimensions well one way to define norm is very very common so so my first example is r3 x is x corresponds to r3 okay and uh, norm x If there are three components x1, x2, x3, then x1 square plus x2, x2 square plus x3 square whole raised to half. This is the definition of the norm. In fact, this will be called as two norm. Okay, so x, this space together with this definition of norm will give you one norm linear space. But this is not the only way to define norm. All these three properties are very obviously satisfied for this. I don't have to even check. Well, my second example, my second example is x corresponds to R3 and then my norm definition is absolute of x1 plus absolute of, F of x2 plus abs of x3. You can check, you can check whether this qualifies to be a norm. Will it be 0 only when x1 is 0, x2 is 0, x3 is 0? And if any one of them is not 0, then the uh, value will be greater than 0. So, first property is satisfied. What about a second property? If I multiply a vector by a scalar alpha, the norm will get multiplied by alpha. Okay. The third property follows also in a straightforward manner from the inequality that if I take any two scalars is always less than mod alpha plus mod beta. This is a simple inequality for scalars. If I if I look at each component as a scalar, I can apply this inequality to each one of them. It will follow that the third triangle inequality is also satisfied by this norm. So this norm, this this function this function which is from the space x to r plus it will always give me a positive value okay equally qualifies to be a norm of the of a vector in three dimensions i don't have to i don't have to always think in this term the third so what i wanted to realize is that this vector space and this vector space are two separate vector spaces two separate norm vector spaces because a norm space comes with a definition of norm on it. 
Okay, so don't say that if I am working with R three, which means I have to have two norm. Okay, I have I am working in three dimensional vector space and I have one norm. This is called one norm. Okay. Uh, so in general, I can show that any function, if x is R three, and I can define what is called as a p norm. x1 to power p plus x2 to power p plus mod uh, absolute of x3 to power p whole raised to 1 by p Where p is a positive integer, where p is a positive integer, this also forms a vector space with p norm defined on it. So this is I am calling it x p. So R three, I can I can extend these definitions of R three to R n n dimensional vector space. A two norm on n dimensional vector space will be x one square plus x two square plus x three square up to x n square whole raised to half. In general, actually. I can define this for any p which is an integer. So one norm, two norm are, you know, some uh, special examples of a p norm vector space. Okay, and I can very easily extend this definition to. I have written here for R three. I can extend this to R n. I can extend this to C n, and so on. Okay. But it's important to note that these three are three different norm vector spaces. The, the definition of norm is different; it's not same. Okay. What about set of continuous functions? How do we define norm on it? Well, before I move to that, let me give you one more example, which is uh, in line with the p norm. The my fourth example is going to be x. Now, instead of writing r three, I'll move to r n. And then I am going to define what is called as infinite norm. Okay, so for any element x that belongs to X, infinite norm is defined as max over i is equal to one two to n mod x i. Infinite norm. This is a n-dimensional vector space. If I if I give you a vector, there are n components. I find out absolute of each component and take max of that. Okay, I find out absolute of each component and then take take a max of that. So there are n values, absolute values, and then find out the maximum. You can show that this also forms a norm. It satisfies all the three properties of uh, a function to be a norm. It will always be greater than zero if x is not equal to zero. It will be equal to zero only when x, only when x is equal to zero or the origin. And then, if you multiply a vector by a scalar, uh, the norm will get multiplied by mod of the scalar. Triangle inequality will be satisfied. So, some of these will be exercise problems. That's why I'm not doing it on the board. My fifth example is. X corresponds to set of continuous functions over uh, zero to one, and then I'm going to define of I'm going to define a norm for an element, say function f t, which belongs to X, is norm of f t. Well, let me let me extend norm of f t using the earlier notions. So I could define uh, I could define an uh, infinite norm, which is max over t belongs to zero to one.
okay infinite norm of this function infinite norm of this function is maximum value of the function over the interval absolute of the maximum value absolute of the maximum value very very important why absolute is required because the norm has to be a positive number it can when will this be zero when will the maximum be zero absolute of the maximum when when you have zero function okay if i multiply a function f by a scalar alpha what will happen to the norm since it's mod absolute value of the scalar will be multiplying the mod right so this this all these see for example if i take a scalar alpha so what is what is absolute of alpha times f of t this will be mod alpha into f of t so if i put max operator that t belongs to 0 to 1 all right so uh which is same as all right so i start with i start with this and i show that it is mod alpha times mod alpha times f of t i can prove the third triangle inequality yep that the function that gives the highest value is the norm of the value of each function the maximum value is the maximum value maximum absolute of the maximum value over interval 0 to 1 over interval 0 to 1 No, for a function, given a function, if I give you a vector, one vector, okay, you find you find you find norm of that vector, no. So if I give you, for example, sine t, okay, where t goes from zero to one, you are expected to find what is the norm of that. Find the maximum value of sine t over interval zero to one. Find absolute of that. That will give you norm of that. Okay. so not over all functions it is over t the max is not over the functions max is over t okay so likewise if i take uh, any two what about the third thing what about the triangle inequality what about triangle inequality if i give you two functions say ft and gt which belong to which belong to that x set of continuous functions over 0 to 1 then what about triangle inequality what we know that at a particular point if i fix t for a fixed t if i fix t then uh then i get function values right Then I get function values. So these are real numbers. We are talking about real valued functions, by the way. So for for real numbers, what I know is f t plus right. For a fixed value of t, I can write this. Okay. now now i can uh, use this inequality and prove the triangle inequality so now what i'm going to do so since this this holds for every t okay i can argue that max
it holds for all t between 0 to 1 so I can write I can take a max operator here okay this is this is nothing but this is equal to norm of ft plus gt right this will be the infinite norm for ft plus gt you agree with me but using this inequality we can say that this is always less than or equal to max of It follows from this inequality, it follows from this inequality that initially I am taking, I am looking at these as two scalar numbers. If you give me two real numbers, this, this inequality holds, see if I take a function over, a, over an interval, if I fix myself to 1t, I will get one scalar value, right. Let us say this is, this is sin t, this is cos t. Okay, if I say that my t is 0.5, I will get some specific value of sin and cos. What we know from a very fundamental inequality is that if I add two real numbers, okay, then that sum will always less than or equal to mod of the sum of mod of two real numbers. Okay, now now actually I want to look at max over all t. So, I am graduating from this inequality to this inequality, okay. But what is this? This is norm ft infinity. What is this? Okay. So, what I have proved is triangle inequality that if I take infinite norm of sum of two functions, okay, it is always less than or equal to this plus this. This is norm of function ft, this is infinite norm of function gt. Is that okay? Everyone with me on this? <coughs> well, I can define now uh, norms which are similar to 1 norm or 2 norm or p norm on these spaces. Infinite norm is not the only way to go about defining norm on this space. So, my next example is it 6th or 7th? What? 7th example? My 6th example is x corresponds to set of continuous functions over 0 to 1 and my norm definition. So, for any ft that belongs to x my norm of ft is uh, p norm is integral 0 uh, integral 0 to 1 i can define a norm which is integral 0 to 1 integral 0 to I need a I need a norm to be a scalar value right I need a norm to be a scalar value if you look at n dimensions if you look at n dimensions how was the norm defined sum of absolute values right sum of absolute values for one norm sum of square of absolute values and then take square root for the two norm for a p norm it was defined you know absolute value of each element raised to p sum it and raised to 1 by p and so on okay so this definition should be logical extension because instead of sum i am getting integral because now t is varying continuously in n dimensional vector space the index i was finite 1 to n okay so we had a summation here we have an integral here we have an integral well p norms though they are defined we normally use only one norm two norm and infinite norm the three norms which are very very commonly used are one norm two norm and so so 
uh, f t one norm would be integral zero to one mod f t d t and two norm is integral zero to one mod f t square d t whole raised to whole raised to half. Okay, so this is this is this is uh, extension of uh, the ideas from three dimensions or from n dimensions to a set of continuous functions and infinite dimensional space. Now, it is not necessary that this should be a uh, limit here should be between 0 to 1. I could actually define a set of continuous function over any interval say a to b, any interval minus 5 to plus 10 or whatever does not matter. My integral here will change from a to b. Okay, My integral here will change from a to b. and so on okay but what you should realize is that this vector space together with a definition of a one specific norm will be one norm linear space one norm space okay so set of continuous functions with one norm is one norm linear space set of continuous function with two norm is another norm linear space they are not same definition of length is different okay how we measure length in one system is not the way we measure length in the other system. Well, there might be advantages of this norm over this norm or advantages of this norm over this infinite norm and indeed that is why we keep using so called two norm very very often that will become clear as we graduate to inner product spaces little later. So why is this Why is this guy so special? Why, why we do not seem to use one norm or infinite norm so often as against this two norm will become clear. Uh, nevertheless, do not think that 2 norm is the only way to define norm. There are many other ways of defining norm. <laughs> okay. Now, to understand this concept of norm, I think we should have one or two more examples and then things will become clear. I have actually given here uh, some arbitrary functions which could be used to define norm. I will just uh, talk about one of them right now here and then uh, we will move on to uh, some other concepts which are important like convergence and I mean, what is the use of defining norm? The one of the use of defining norm is to talk about limit and convergence. Okay. Now, what happens in iterative processes is that uh, you have some idea about iterative processes like Newton Raphson. Everyone I think knows about Newton Raphson. Okay. In Newton Raphson, what do you do? You start with a guess value and then you get another guess. From the new guess, you construct third guess and fourth guess. So, you get what is called as a sequence of vectors. Okay. The question that you need to answer when you solve a numerical problem is this is that is this sequence converging to something? Is it converging to my solution? In fact, that is what is in your mind. But at least before whether to know whether it is going to the solution or not, you would like to know whether it is converging. So, convergence is a very, very critical uh, thing in in numerical analysis and when you work with n dimensional spaces you need to generalize the concept of convergence we know we know about a sequence of real numbers converging to a point and we call it limit all those things we have done in 12th standard right but now what is the meaning of a function sequence converging to a limit we'll have to talk about these ideas okay so that's why we need this now uh, just to give you uh, just to give you a feeling that the norm can be defined in different ways. I will just take the same x which is set of uh, once differentiable continuous function. I will take set of once differentiable continuous function okay. and let me let me define a function. You have to tell me whether it will define a norm or not. So, what about candidate function? Uh, so, I have this function f t that is, is equal to uh, that belongs to this x. So, this is a once differentiable continuous function. Okay. Now, uh, 
I am defining a norm of Ft as uh, max over t belongs to 0 to 1 mod of d f by dt derivative i am taking derivative of the function okay df by dt question is does this function define the norm why huh. zero great so what does it mean a non zero a non zero vector is giving me zero value a non zero vector is giving me a zero value So this is a non-zero function f of t is equal to constant okay and that will yield that will yield zero norm if I use this definition. So this function cannot be cannot qualify as a norm okay there are more such examples given listed here you should go through them this is on page 12 okay um, I have listed many other functions and I have solved systematically. So you have to if I if I give you a function and ask you to check whether this function satisfies to be a norm or not you have to you have to systematically look at all the three axioms first you have to look for whether non zero element gives you a zero vector okay whether the second thing is alpha times uh, original vector does it give you mod alpha times and a third property is triangle inequality okay even in three dimensions there are multiple ways of defining norms see for example you can define a norm in three dimensions if I have x is r3 uh, if I give you a, a matrix w which is uh, which is symmetric and positive definite then then I can define a norm of a vector x in three dimensions as x transpose w x okay you can show that x transpose w x will also sorry uh, raised to half x transpose w x so we call this as two norm with matrix w where w is some symmetric positive definite matrix if this matrix is if this matrix is singular which means if it is semi definite and not semi definite what is the semi definite matrix not all eigenvalues are positive so it means it has some eigenvalues equal to 0 so some eigenvalues are equal to 0 we will we'll visit this animal uh, definite positive definite semi definite many times so let us wait for that right now let us wait for that but just think about this this w cannot be singular if this w matrix is singular then it will not define a norm because a singular matrix singular matrix can take a non zero vector to zero yesterday we looked at that right we had a singular matrix with three columns which are linearly dependent a singular matrix can take a non zero vector to zero vector so which means a non zero vector can give you a zero value for the norm which is not acceptable so it will not be a norm okay so w has to be a okay so the next thing that i want to want to talk about is convergence of a sequence of vectors so as i said we are going to deal with iterative iterative processes so the let's say uh, you will have iterative processes which will give you x k plus 1 is equal to some function f of x k this is a
Okay, we have we have an iterative process in which we start with a guess solution, and then that guess is used to construct the next guess, and then that guess is used to construct the next guess. Newton Raphson method. All of you know about this. We are going to generalize the Newton Raphson method from one dimension to n dimensions or to a function space and so on. So that time you will have sequence of vectors in n dimensions, and I need to know whether they are close to each other or they are diverging. How do I know about that? I need to use definitions of norm. If I have a sequence of functions generated in the method, how do I know whether this sequence of functions is converging? to a solution or it is not converging i need to use definition of norm that's where we go, that's where we need this norm definition generalized because we need to talk about you know convergence of a sequence we need to talk about limit of a sequence so we'll we'll look at this uh, concept in my in our next next lecture uh, it's important to uh, understand keep in mind that why it is being done it's being done for dealing with iterative processes okay so in the next lecture we will look at conversions and uh, sequences we will have something called cauchy sequence which almost converges and a conversion sequence and we will also look at some funny properties funny things that happen in infinite dimensional spaces you have a sequence which converges but the limit is not in the space the limit is outside the space so and so on I will show you some examples where these funny things happen. So, uh, 